Well, we've heard uh, from uh, the story of Moses that uh, Ray read to us. And I want now a, a New Testament reading, and I've taken some verses from Ephesians chapter 4, and first of all, verses 1 to 8, and then 11 to 16. As prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, he says, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Okay, so what is that worthy life? It's this. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What a definition of being human that is. Those who will attain to the full measure of Christ. That's our goal. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemings. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every support and ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay. Everyone has a part to play. If you have your Bibles open in front of you, they can be open in Acts chapter 6, to which I'll be referring in a moment or two. Um, last week I highlighted some of the ways by which the church's mission to contend for the faith, to proclaim the truth, can be undermined. Paul talks about the devil and his schemes, and that we must not be unaware of what he's about. Because if we know what the enemy is planning, what the tactics are, we can take countermeasures. Peter tells us that the devil is always on the prowl, looking for opportunities, seeking those whom he can devour. It's a strong metaphor, isn't it? You want to be on your guard if there's a, a prowling lion. Um, on the way. So scripture forewarns us so that we can be forearmed. And one of the things that we looked at last week was that we needed to be on our guard against diversionary tactics. And I pointed out that Luke has recorded in Acts chapter 6 one of those tactics, if you like, that will, could have been a great diversion. But actually this episode in Acts it actually flags up two of the schemes of the enemy. The first is disagreement which would then lead to a bad feeling and a divided church. So in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, we read this. In those days, those days, you know, following the birth of the church, the day of Pentecost, and people will come into faith in their thousands. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food bit of background there, Hellenistic Jews were Jews who had moved away from Israel and were, were probably Greek um, speaking and uh, lots of Hellenistic Jews would return to Jerusalem for the great festivals of the faith. And uh, um, we are told in one of the Gospels that two of these Hellenistic Jews came to the city, so as we would see Jesus. These are people who would come from different parts of the empire, but also when um, a Jewish man knew that he was approaching the age where he might die soon, a lot of the Hellenistic Jews would return to Israel and to Jerusalem to die in Jerusalem. But that would mean that their widows would get left behind. 
Right? So you've got this group of Hellenistic Jewish widows and also the Judaistic, not always in Jerusalem and Judea widows, and they were two separate groups. You'd have noticed them, I think, probably with different accents from the way that they spoke. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, there arose this dispute uh, because the Hellenistic widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Remember, as a widow, they would have had no other means of support, and especially perhaps having come to faith in Jesus the Messiah, whatever means of support they once did have from the synagogue might have then been taken away from them. So this was not a Jew against Gentile issue. That crops up later. It's down the road in Acts when you've got the issue of Jews and Gentiles. This is two groups of Jews. And it seems that there was favoritism, but we're not told whether it was deliberate or simply accidental. But whether deliberate or accidental, it needed sorting. And the apostles knew that it needed sorting. And not to have done so would have been a serious blot on the witness of the church, because those people are, oh, these, so these you know, Jewish widows have come to believe that Jesus and Messiah, look how they're suffering, and their own people can't be bothered to look after them. The temptation would surely have been then, I think, for the apostles to have made it their priority issue. They couldn't let this blot on the early witness of the church go on any longer, but they could only have addressed it personally by putting to one side, perhaps only temporarily, their calling to proclaim the word of God. And if they then put aside their calling to proclaim the word of God, then their witness would also have been dulled. It looked like a lose-lose situation. But it wasn't. There was a solution. What was it? Well, I found myself wondering, and again I referred to this last week, but I found myself wondering if Peter just calls to mind what happened when Jesus was faced with a similar dilemma. Now it's highly likely that Mark's gospel, probably the first of our four gospels to have been uh, written, um, relied heavily upon Peter. In other words, Mark is asking Peter, tell us about it. Mark's gospel probably written in Rome. In fact, some scholars have suggested that we shouldn't call it the gospel according to St. Mark, but the gospel according to St. Peter, because it's Peter that lies behind it. So I found myself wondering whether Peter on this occasion, when he's got this dispute in front of him and he wonders, he's wondering what to do, remembers the story that he then later tells Mark to include in his gospel. That evening, we are told, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demonized. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. So imagine the ripples being gone out. People rejoicing, telling their friends, their relatives the stories. Look at me, I've been healed. How did that happen? Well, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He also drove out many demons. But he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. I haven't got time to explain that now. But you can see Jesus that day was busy. <laughs> the cr people were crowding around him, clamoring for his attention. Well, as we saw last week, we then told that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Now, from that, I take that sometimes when life and ministry can be very busy, you just need to take sometimes some time out to reorientate your center in the Lord. And so Jesus spends a long time in prayer after a very busy day. I would spend a long time in bed after a very busy day. Yeah? But here they are. They, they, Jesus gets up and he prays so that when then Simon and the apostles find him and say, Lord, everyone's looking to you. He knows what God his Father's will is for him because he's been praying about it half the night. And so he can look Simon in the eye. Oh. There's a big crowd waiting for me, is there? Okay, let's go somewhere else. Yeah. 
Everyone is looking for you, Jesus replied. Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So Jesus is flagging up the priority of the ministry of the word over other even legitimate calls, if you like, on his time. And I wonder if Peter remembered that story when he's thinking about what to do with this dispute that could suck up a lot of his time and attention, not only in trying to figure out how to do it, but then actually doing it as well. Now, I don't know that Peter brought that to mind, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if he had remembered that story, that example of his Lord when there was a conflicting demand upon his time and resources. So what happened? Well, Peter was clear. This was not an issue that was to take up either his or the other apostles' time and attention. Others needed to be found who would step up to address the grievance so that the apostles could continue their God-given calling as ministers of the word. Luke tells us this. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. You can see why I asked Ray to read from Exodus. Because Moses also had faced a similar dilemma centuries before and it's his father-in-law who tells him Moses you blonker what are you doing You've, you 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 can't do this on your own you need to appoint others you need to delegate to good and godly people who can take the strain off you since the pandemic if not also before there's been something of a volunteering crisis in the church throughout the UK. Churches are struggling to find people to take responsibility. And it's theme that I'm coming across both locally when I talk to other church leaders of all denominations, and it's also there in the national Christian press here in the UK. In fact, uh, somebody has, has written a book about it how to encourage volunteers who don't want to volunteer or something like that. <laughs> and you can see what's happened. In some cases, uh, in order to try and fill the gaps that there are in church life, other already busy people are having to put down what they have been doing, what they are called and gifted to do, in order to do stuff that they can't find anybody else to do just in order to keep the church going and to keep the church ticking over. But it comes at a cost. A vicar I spoke to just a few months ago, someone gifted and called in one-to-one -one evangelism in, in a way that, you know, I would love to be, but aren't. She expressed her frustration in hardly ever ever having the time to get alongside people in her parish to get to know them and to share the good news of Jesus because her diary was filled with just sort of administrative stuff from this committee and that committee just to keep the show on the road but it came at a cost of her being able to exercise a ministry of the word and helping to bring people to Christ. The last verse of that um, section from Ephesians, I said that it, from him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love. As each part does its work. That's the NIV translation. Let me take you to the New Living translation. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So the question to us all is, are you playing your part?
Now, this is not a question, um, you know, for people who are already doing more than their fair share. This is not a question for those who would like to do more, but for reasons of age or disability or family circumstances or whatever, can't respond. We get that. We understand that. But this is a question for any among us who could be doing more, but don't. And in the next couple of weeks, I'll be highlighting ministry areas in the church where we need people to step up and so release others to do what they are gifted and called to do. So please pray and listen. And when the time comes, I'll hope you respond. But you can see perhaps why when I was digging up the potatoes in the garden this last week, I thought of the Tater family. Yeah. And I hope that's not your surname following this surname. But you're someone who can respond and do. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your word is quite clear that in the body of Christ, each of us has a distinct and special part to play. And as we sometimes have wondered about that, what that is, Lord, we pray that in the coming weeks, as we look to the future of World Baptist Church and the other churches in the town, that if there's something that is to be laid upon our hearts, that you will do so. And that when the opportunity to serve comes, <coughs> There will be a ready response. Here am I, Lord. Use me. Send me. To that end, will you then build your church? May we each one do our part and so build one another up in love to the glory of your matchless name. Amen.